My analyses of the Jedi Covenant seer Ronate will be drawn from her primary appearance in the Knights of the Old Republic comic series, with additional information pulled from the KOTOR Handbook, the KOTOR Campaign Guide, and the complete Star Wars Encyclopedia. My analyses of the independent Sith warlord Odeon will be drawn from his primary appearances in the Knight Errant comic series and novel, with additional information pulled from the Knight Errant Gazetteer and the Book of Sith. Background information on both combatants and the overall Star Wars setting will be drawn from the Essential Guide to the Force, the Jedi Path, the Old Republic Encyclopedia, and the New Essential Guide to Alien Species, among many others. Beyond the fact that both are major antagonists in comic series written by John Jackson Miller, the main commonality between these two combatants is that both of their lives were ultimately defined by their runaway sense talents, which led to them developing into fanatics who followed the most perverted versions of their respective doctrines. Ronate, Jedi Master of the Old Republic, and Lord Odeon, Sith Warlord of the Republic Dark Age. If these two deranged renegades were to meet in single combat, who would win? Jedi Master Rana Tay was a Togruta female native to her species homeworld of Shili. As the youngest member of the First Watch Circle, I estimate her age to be somewhere in her mid-30s. Togruta were distinguished by their hollow mantrals and head tails, which provided echolocation and a finely tuned spatial awareness, expressed in Rana's case through her use of combat parkour to keep up with Zane Carrick's jetpack. A conventional humanoid otherwise, she possessed a slender build and was garbed in ornate dress robes, a far cry from the humble dress favored by mainline Jedi. In addition to her high acrobatic ability, Ronate demonstrated a refined dexterity, casually balancing her lightsaber on her fingertip. In regards to physical strength, she was something of a middleweight. As a teenager, she was overpowered by Lucian Dre, but as an adult, she held her own against Del Mumu in a fist fight, and executed a successful acrobatic power attack against Zane Carrick. Ronate's physical tolerances were tested by her lifelong battle with Runaway Farsight, which left her stricken with crippling migraines and night terrors as a child. Sent to Krinda Dre for medical help, Rana became reliant on her fellow seers to help her regulate her thoughts and cope with her powers. When the Jedi Council unknowingly dissolved the First Watch Circle, Rana was deprived of this support, and the resurgence of her childhood symptoms resulted in bouts of insomnia, leaving her increasingly reliant on drugs to function. Additionally, one of the core teachings of the Jedi Covenant was, if the hand endangers the limb, strike it off, a tenet that Rana upheld to the very end. That being said, though clearly willing to continue fighting until she is dead, she was still mortal, and the wounds she sustained in her final battle with Zane Carrick clearly undercut her physical performance. After enduring a flurry of glass shards embedding themselves in her skin, and a lightsaber thrust through her lower abdomen, Ronate ultimately died when she got her arm caught on the broken rim of a skylight in the Jedi Tower, and she failed to free herself in time to escape the building's demolition. Lord Odeon was a human male born into the Sith aristocracy within the Grumani sector during the late Dragulch period. Given that he was already a well-established Sith Enforcer in 1042 BBY, ten years before his death in 1032, I would estimate his age to be in the mid-30s. A conventional humanoid, Odeon possessed a stocky, muscular build, Though he was afflicted by severe dark side degeneration, 
displaying a corpse gray skin tone, total hair loss, and permanently yellow eyes. Odeon's primary attribute was his exceptional physical strength, expressed through his powerful lightsaber technique and best demonstrated when he hurled Kira Holt through the air on Chelua. His agility, on the other hand, was middling. Though clearly quick on his feet, he refrained from acrobatics and was ultimately outmaneuvered by Holt on board the Spike. That being said, he proved to be a skilled jetpacker, navigating the battlefield on Chelua and infiltrating the caves on Scarpos. Like Ronate, Odeon's physical tolerances were also tested by runaway sense talents, in his case hypersensitive telepathic perceptions that left him with crippling headaches. But where Rana was provided with therapy by the Covenant, Odeon self-medicated by killing people, snuffing out the bright lights that pained him so. He grew into a battle-hardened warrior, tough enough to survive catastrophic burns from a starship thruster which fused half of his armor to his body and necessitated the reconstruction of the left side of his face and head. Though these cybernetics were initially quite obvious, Odeon evidently underwent a complete cosmetic reconstruction with realistic facial prosthetics. Furthermore, Lord Odeon was garbed in a modular set of Sith dark armor, typically consisting of red-plated pauldrons, gauntlets, greaves, a codpiece, and a breastplate affixed to a black form-fitting bodysuit. However, despite his frontline experience, Odeon was ultimately cowardly and paranoid, the underlying goal behind his genocidal campaigns being to ensure his own personal security. Appropriately, he died off the battlefield, burned to death by dark side energies emitted by the ancient Sith Helm of Yeldis after a failed attempt to use the artifact to eradicate sentient life. As a Togruta, Rana's non-human anatomy provided inborn advantages, whereas Odeon's cybernetics were installed after the fact, and he was a baseline human otherwise. Between the two, I consider the enhanced spatial sense provided by Tay's Montrals to be a more significant factor, though her ability to capitalize on it is determined by her physical and mental state. However, getting half of one's face replaced with prosthetic add-ons is no small thing. Between Odeon successfully overpowering Kira Holt and Ronate being overpowered by Lucian Dre, I think it's fair to say that Odeon possesses a significant strength advantage. But conversely, Odeon was outmaneuvered by Holt and driven back by Gorlin Paladane, and Rana is definitely fast and savage enough to achieve similar feats. As both are so perfectly optimized to be able to land hits against one another, I view this conclusion as coming down to who is better at taking hits. On the one hand, Ronate will ignore injuries and fight until she is dead, but as a result, she's burning her candle from both ends and doesn't know when to quit. On the other hand, Odeon is better armored, and his cowardice ultimately makes him a better survivalist. He's tougher, stronger, better equipped, and better at staying alive. And for these reasons, Lord Odeon gets the edge for physical ability. Master Ronate was armed with a standard Jedi lightsaber, distinguished by its ornate design aesthetic and tapered pommel, and projecting a green plasma blade, likely generated by an Adegan crystal. Though her chosen lightsaber form is unconfirmed, I view her demonstrated technical proficiencies as aligning best with the aggression form Ataru. A dexterity-based offensive swordswoman, Tay used acrobatic lunges and spins to traverse her environment and to deliver sweeping slashes and cleaves. Additionally, she was a competent hand-to-hand -hand fighter and has brandished twin lightsabers. 
However, Ronate had trained with the Shicho master Lucien Dre since they were teenagers, and had clearly taken multiple cues from his approach. Though perfectly capable of unleashing a sustained whirlwind offensive, tearing through Zane Carrick's defenses on Terrace, she instead pursued a single-stroke victory, bisecting Zane Carrick's speeder bike and destroying Del Mumo's blasters. As a Jedi Covenanteer, Ronate was a Sith Hunter. As a member of the First Watch Circle, she relied on Farsight to predict and prevent future disasters, nipping threats in the bud through any means necessary. As a strategist and field operative, Tay favored ambush and deception, hiring the bounty-hunting Mumo brothers to shadow Arvin Carrick on Telegraph with the goal of ambushing Zane and later attempting to manipulate Shell Jelavan, the sister of one of the Terrace Padawans, into murdering Zane. However, though clearly intelligent, Ronate was emotionally unstable, and ultimately a poor judge of character, both of her schemes failing due to her poor choice of tools. The Telegraph scheme was bungled by the Mumo brothers, who instead abducted Arvin and tipped Rana's hand to Zane. As for Shell Jelavan, the moment she learned the truth about the Padawan Massacre, she literally stabbed Ronate in the back. Rana combined emotional instability with poor judgment, and was ultimately consumed by that one attribute that any Sith worth their salt could manipulate, fear. All that being said, she proved her mettle on multiple occasions as a devastating warrior, cleaving through rack ghouls and Mandalorians alike like a hot knife through butter, and bullying through Zane Carrick's stall tactics before grounding him. Ronate fought with the relentless aggression of a fanatic, utterly convinced of her righteousness even as she butchered children. Lord Odeon was armed with a standard Sith lightsaber, which sported prominent emitter guards and projected a red blade, no doubt generated by a traditional Sith synthetic crystal. Given the wild variance in the practice and interpretation of Sith doctrine within the Grumani sector, it is entirely possible that he never studied the Seven Forms. That being said, I view his overall fighting style as matching up best with the determination form Shi Cho. A savage, strength-based swordsman, Odeon favored a basic moveset consisting of wide cleaving slashes, stalwart blocks, and thrusting backstabs. Though dynamic and highly mobile, he favored grounded footwork and upright stances, and generally refrained from acrobatics. He supplemented this gritty, battlefield-oriented technique with physical grapples and integrated force lightning. But more than anything else, I believe that Shi Cho's core practice of surrendering completely to the flow of the force would play strongly into Odeon's primary force ability, which was to channel the pain and misery around him to telepathically project suicidal aggression and madness. This power served as the crux of Odeon's strategy, disrupting enemy battle plans by causing their troops to break ranks, turning battles into meat grinders where his own heavily armed and armored suicide troops could dominate. A gleeful mass murderer, he favored the use of superweapons in large-scale campaigns, shipping in a kinetic corruptor on Chelua and a death spiral emplacement on Gazari. In single combat, he worked to undermine his opponent's composure with psychological warfare enabled by telepathic probing, and was more than happy to backstab a distracted opponent. Summarizing Odeon's performance against Jedi opponents, during his first assault on Chelawa, he contended evenly with Van Artrice and physically overpowered Kira Holt, before backstabbing Treese after the kinetic corruptor activated. On board the Spike, he successfully rooted out Holt with his telepathic ability and mounted a pursuit, but he ultimately failed to prevent her escape. After his disastrous return to Chelua, Odeon recklessly pursued Holt with his jetpack while she leapfrogged across several flying ships, only to be engaged by Gorlin Paladin, who drove Odeon into the burning thrusters of one of the ships, 
with Odeon only narrowly escaping with his jetpack. Lord Odeon was at his best when he had the element of surprise, as his success was predicated on undercutting enemies rather than outwitting them. A heavyweight combatant, he went out of his way to escalate the violence, turning battle into a meat grinder. However, against opponents who kept their distance and refused to be provoked, he advanced too far, too fast. His style was designed to deal with the savage knee-jerk aggression projected by his mental abilities, not a dissection delivered by a skilled opponent. As his brother Lord Damon phrased it, Odeon's idea of surprise was to punch with his left hand instead of his right. Starting from the top with a comparison of their weaponry, both wielded standard lightsabers that provide no specific advantages in combat, the unique design features of each being merely aesthetic. Though their respective chosen lightsaber forms are unconfirmed, both favored the archetypal fighting styles of their respective organizations. Rana being a traditionally acrobatic, dexterity-based Jedi Knight, and Odeon being a traditionally grounded, strength-based Sith warrior. Furthermore, both were optimized to deliver counters against aggressive opponents, and both tended to overextend against defensive opponents. On the one hand, the fact that Ronate was overpowered by Lucian Dre and backstabbed by Shell Jellivan demonstrates that Odeon is strong and treacherous enough to pose a serious threat, but on the other, Odeon was outmaneuvered by Kira Holt and driven back by Gorlin Paladin's suicidal charge, proving that Rana is quick and aggressive enough to pose a serious threat in turn. Addressing their broader strategic approaches, they were again perfectly optimized to engage one another. Ranate's use of ambush and deception was proven viable by Odeon's failed conquest of Chelua, where his armies were destroyed by Lord Damon's concealed kinetic corruptors, and his reckless pursuit of Kira Holt left him open to Gorlin Paladin's ambush. But conversely, Odeon's reliance on psychological warfare and goading is perfectly suited to disrupting Rana's plans by triggering her mental instability, which is made all the worse by her poor judgment. However, even when she gave in to her rage against Zane Carrick, Rana Tay remained focused, overpowering his lightsaber defense and disarming him before deflecting his blaster fire while using acrobatics to keep pace with his jetpack before disabling it. Lord Odeon ultimately predicates his success on his ability to essentially force his opponents to fight stupid, whereas as unhinged as Rana may be, she is by no means unintelligent. Though I have to stress that her advantage is by a very slim margin, as she is still overextending against a treacherous opponent, Ranate gets the edge as a martial artist and lightsaber duelist. Ranate's most notable and developed force ability was Farsight, which proved to be an uncomfortable gift, for perception is a tool that's pointed on both ends. As a child, she was afflicted with crippling migraines and night terrors, having been originally sent to Krinda Dre to learn how to manage her condition. Her therapy sessions with Krinda's Jedi Seers were ultimately successful, and the grateful Rana pledged herself to the Jedi Covenant. Trained as a Jedi Consular, Tay's exceptional aptitude as a Seer earned her a place on the First Watch Circle. Alongside Masters Zamar, Kanelia, and Faun, Ranate was specifically tasked with carrying out the Jedi Covenant's mandate of probing the currents of the future to predict and prevent the return of the Sith. Ultimately, their misinterpretation of the Rogue Moon prophecy led them to perpetrate the Padawan Massacre of Taris, while also failing to detect the rise of Revan and Malak, which took place practically right under their noses. Similarly, their attempt to predict Zane Carrick's activities was also misinterpreted, leading to a needless confrontation with Rakghouls and Gamorrean slavers in the Terrace Underlevels. 
Ranate was unusual amongst Jedi Consulars in that, outside of her group meditations with the First Watch Circle, she strongly favored physical combat over Force abilities. Her first response in battle was to use enhanced acrobatics to close the distance, lightsaber drawn, and by the end of her life she was clearly channeling her rage. Conversely, she has not demonstrated any aptitude with healing techniques nor energy manipulation. Even her full telekinetic power was only unleashed in a fit of rage, and she otherwise used it only for combat utility, such as retrieving her lightsaber. Ronate's guilt over her participation in the Padawan Massacre led to a resurgence of her childhood symptoms, and the subsequent breakup of the First Watch Circle by the Jedi Council removed the support system upon which she still relied. As a result, her nightmares prevented her from sleeping for more than an hour at a stretch, leaving her increasingly reliant on drugs to function and badly impairing her use of farsight. When she confronted Zane Carrick in the Jedi Tower on Terrace, she was completely deranged and ultimately blind to other threats. Lord Odian's development as a Sith Lord was dictated by his hypersensitive telepathic abilities, which made the mere existence of other beings painful to him, leaving him with crippling headaches. However, with this disability came the unusual ability to channel the pain and misery around him to project suicidal aggression into external subjects, which he used to disrupt enemy battle plans and egg on his own forces. This capacity to instigate violence drove his growth as a Sith warrior, while his need to feed on pain and misery dictated his leadership style as an independent Sith warlord. His domain, the Odeonet, was a brooding dystopia intended to promote despair, while his immediate Sith followers, the Novitiates, were a suicide cult with an axe to grind. On his developed worlds, the pain and misery of his enslaved workers allowed him to instill immediate suicidal madness in fresh subjects. On the battlefield, he exercised a subtler influence on enemy combatants already in the throes of aggression. He reinforced his mental influence with goading taunts, themselves informed by his ability to probe the thoughts of others. Savoring the pain relief he experienced when ending lives, Odeon remembered every person he had ever killed and could sense future deaths attached to objects and places. Otherwise, Odeon heavily emphasized physical combat, clearly driving force enhancement with dark rage, frequently demonstrating superhuman strength and agility. However, though surviving Starship Thruster Burns demonstrated his ability to focus through pain, Odeon did not display any ability with healing techniques, a typical weakness of Darksiders. Though his injuries necessitated a cybernetic refit, his continued ability to project Force Lightning indicated that the overhaul likely did not include prosthetic limbs. Instead, the ability that Odeon failed to demonstrate was telekinesis clearly preferring to make others into vessels of destruction and cut them loose, rather than to unleash it himself. The main limitation of Lord Odeon's power was his need for massive quantities of pain and misery to enable his more impressive feats. For this reason, Odeon spent the entirety of his career searching for the Helm of Ealdus, a Sith artifact created by an ancient lord with the same affliction to amplify his mental influence. Odeon's ultimate plan was to use one of his child education facilities on Vanaheim to fuel the helm, allowing him to project his powers on a galactic scale with the stated goal of eradicating sentient life. Fortunately, before Odeon could unleash the full power of the helm, one of his own betrayed him. Kira Holt had managed to get through to Odeon's most trusted lieutenant, who released the children. The resulting relief and joy from the child subjects caused the Helm's powers to turn inwards, and Sith Lord Odeon was burned to death by Dark Force energy. 
In Ranate and Lord Odeon, we have two extremely dangerous radicals who embraced the most twisted versions of the philosophies of their respective orders. This shared state of mind, fueled by the agony of their hypersensitive mental abilities, ultimately leading both down a path of madness and murder. In a practical sense, their common overemphasis on sense branch abilities made them unusual variations on their respective archetypes, as they lacked many of the powers common to Jedi Consulars and Sith Warriors. Despite their strong independent streaks, both were ultimately reliant on the support of their fellows to fill in the gaps in their skill sets and function in their respective roles. In Ranate's case, despite her aptitude as a seer, her ability to capitalize on this power was inconsistent even when she was supported by the First Watch Circle, as their visions were symbolic in nature and therefore subject to interpretation. Furthermore, her degradation while operating independently effectively crippled this ability, clear visions replaced by nightmarish delusions. Ultimately, Rana effectively predicated her success on passive perception, whereas Lord Odeon unleashed active telepathy, thought probes informing psychological warfare that in turn supported his projected bloodlust. Not only is Rana Tay already prone to mental instability, but Lord Odeon, in his bright red armor, directly resembles the figure she beheld in the Rogue Moon Prophecy, meaning that she is quite likely to panic against this particular opponent. This in mind, a hypothetical confrontation between these two would be fought on Odeon's terms, playing out as a direct slugging match. Discussing their conventional combative abilities, both channeled their emotions to drive force enhancement, and both supported lightsaber combat with blunt offensive powers. Between Ronate's telekinesis and Lord Odeon's Force Lightning, I consider Odeon's Lightning to be more advantageous, as defensive telekinesis is extremely common, while combative Tutaminus is extremely rare. Furthermore, though neither have demonstrated any skill with healing techniques, Odeon is clearly better prepared to handle injury, combining physical hardiness with heavy armor where Rana is a relative lightweight. That being said, despite overextending almost constantly, Rana's lightsaber technique is focused enough to keep Odeon on his back foot and potentially overwhelm his defenses. Although Ranate would be almost certainly susceptible to Odeon's telepathic influence and vulnerable against his Force Lightning, there is a strong possibility that his mental projections may backfire, an expert Jedi duelist empowered by induced Force Rage potentially being more than he can handle. As I see it, the closest analog for how this hypothetical battle would play out is the confrontation between Satil Shen and Darth Malgus depicted in the Hope cinematic trailer. Even if Ranate isn't provoked by Odeon, she is almost certain to strike first anyway, flinging herself at this Sith opponent. However, like Malgus, Odeon has a better recovery strategy, soaking up hits with his armor while bullying through the opponent's assault with brute strength. It must be remembered that Gorlan Paladin bested Odeon by herding him towards an environmental hazard, not by penetrating his defenses. Like Shan, Rana would likely unleash her telekinesis as an area of effect strike, while Odeon would likely use a direct force attack to set up for a fatal lightsaber strike. Unlike Satil Shan, Ranate is not capable of combative to to menace, and can neither redirect force lightning nor catch a lightsaber blade. However, I have to stress that this battle is extremely close, as both combatants are perfectly optimized to exploit one another's weaknesses, but Odeon is simply more defensively viable. I declare Sith Lord Odeon the victor.